Thank you all for joining us this evening. I'm Matthew Silverman, the director of the Haberman Institute for Jewish Studies. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our program titled Strangers at the Gate, a, Bib a biblical view of Israelites and their neighbors with Dr. Adrian Levine. I would like to extend a special thank you to Andrew Ammerman for sponsoring this lecture in, uh, in loving memory of H. Max and Josephine Ammerman, Stephen C. Ammerman, Dr. Harvey and Linnell Ammerman, and Dr. Bruce Ammerman. Thank you, Andrew. We appreciate all your leadership, collaboration, and support of adult Jewish learning. I would also like to thank our partner, Washington Hebrew Congregation, for helping bring this lecture to the community. The connection between Washington Hebrew and the Haberman Institute runs deep, and we look forward to a meaningful ongoing partnership. With that, I would now like to welcome Rabbi Aaron Miller, Associate Rabbi at Washington Hebrew Congregation, to say a few words of welcome. Thank you, Matt. Um, I want to welcome uh, all of you and say what an honor it is to be here over Zoom with all of you I know from around the world. Um, it is a joy to be here. It's a joy to celebrate this moment uh, with the Haberman Institute and also to be a part of the a uh, wonderful continuation of Rabbi Joshua Haberman's legacy. Uh, rabbi Haberman was the senior rabbi at Washington Hebrew for decades. And uh, upon his retirement, he founded the Foundation for Jewish Studies in 1983, which he led as the organization, and he led the organization as chair of the board through the summer of 2017. Um, then in 2018, as the name of the organization changed, uh, to the Haberman Institute for Jewish Studies, we as Washington Hebrew continue to deepen that partnership. Uh, Washington Hebrew is a congregation that cares deeply about adult education. Uh, Rabbi Haberman, a blessed memory, uh, cared deeply about the continuation of adult education. And so as our organizations continue to, to grow together, we found countless ways of partnering together to make sure that our community and, uh, and the memory of our founding rabbi could continue to be, uh, not our founding rabbi, but a senior rabbi could continue to be uh, for a blessing. Um, we have done this many times before in wonderful partnership with the Haberman Institute. Um, uh, in large thanks to Andrew Ammerman, uh, which Matt, uh, who Matt already introduced, uh, who's been a wonderful partner and friend of both organizations. Um, I know I was just on the phone with him yesterday and how excited he is for this continued collaboration. Um, so Andrew, I, I believe you are here from Hawaii, and I want to thank you for making this and so many other wonderful partnerships throughout the Washington region uh, happen. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Matt. And I'd like to hand things over to Harvey. Thank you, Rabbi Miller. And welcome everyone joining us today from our local community in the DC metro area and to so many more joining from across North America and beyond. We are looking forward to this evening's program, Strangers at the Gate, a biblical view of Israelites and their neighbors. This program is two years in the making, originally scheduled for exactly two years ago today, May 19th, 2020. We are thrilled to finally welcome Dr. Levine to our community. I'm Harvey Iglarsh, a Haberman Institute of Jewish Studies board member. To those of you who are new to our lectures and classes, we are glad you are here learning with us today. Our mission is to provide adults with high quality, in-depth encounters with Jewish thought, history, and culture. This evening's lecture will explore encounters between Israelites and their neighbors. Among the most important matters explored in biblical narratives, yet Relatively little attention has been paid to them. This is somewhat surprising, especially since, as we'll see today, these are really good stories that reverberate in our communities today. We invite you to learn more about our programs and classes by visiting our website, HabermanInstitute.org. Our next program is coming up on June 1st, Revelation and Remembrance, Recapturing the Echoes of Sinai, a lecture in memory of our friend and teacher, Effie West, please join us online or in person in Rockville, Maryland to learn together. And now, on to our talk this evening. Dr. Adrian Levine is Senior Lecturer in Hebrew Bible at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, having previously taught at Stanford University. Her books include Biblical Narratives of Israelites and Their Neighbors, Strangers at the Gates, and Memory and Tradition, in the Book of Numbers. She has published in a number of scholarly journals, including Proof Text, Journal of the Study of the Old Testament, and Harvard's Theological Review. Her passion includes 
Biblical Prophets, and the Book of Job. She is the grandmother of Ezra, age three, and a newborn, Ari, I believe, and is therefore a ferocious community organizer on behalf of our precious planet as a volunteer at Jewish Climate Action Network, New York City, and JTree USA. Dr. Levine is married to Arnold Eisen, Chancellor Emeritus of the Jewish Theological Cemetery. And with that, the Zoom box is yours, Dr. Levine. I know we're all looking forward to learning with you this evening. Thank you for sharing your expertise and insight with us. Thank you so much. Um, welcome everybody to this talk tonight. I am glad to be here with all of you. Uh, my husband today was actually at the graduation and ordination services at the uh, Jewish Theological Seminary. So um, thank you for mentioning him to another proud grandparent in the bunch. Um, I want to start before I get into my remarks just to um, comment on the way that we're doing this tonight. You're going to have me talk to you. I'm not going to be able to see you. I really love interacting with people. So I'm asking you, um, as you listen to me, take notes. If I say something that you don't understand or you want to comment on or you want to go back to. And at the end, we will hopefully have a really robust conversation about some of the material that I'm going to present to you right now. Um, you know, that's, that's why we write. We write so we can engage um, with the public on some of these big issues. Uh, Bible, whatever it is, for me, it's biblical stories. So I really am eager to hear from you. So don't be shy. Don't be hold, don't hold back. Uh, certainly be polite, but um, I look forward to you, um, your comments at the end. Um, so thank you for having me speak tonight, if I did not yet say that. And the subject, um, as you heard, is Strangers at the Gate, a biblical view of Israelites and their neighbors. And I, I uh, am basing this lecture on the book uh, with that similar title, it's reversed, uh, that I published in 2017. So here's my one and only prop of the evening. This is the book that came out in 2017. What prompted me to write such a book about this particular topic? We have to go back 20 years to the morning of September 11, 2001. I was on a United plane that morning that did not take off. Word had come through that the World Trade Towers had been hit. Then I heard about the Pentagon. Soon after, a plane crashed into a Pennsylvania field. Unfortunately, I'm sure you all remember that morning as well. That morning, a series of violent acts in the name of religion took countless lives, shocked the world, and shattered hope. Violence in the name of religion was not new, but its recurrence was the source of despair. The 21st century promised to be a more peaceful and secure time, yet conflicts between different ethnic groups, peoples, and religions were ever more dangerous than in the past. They crossed borders, they occurred anywhere at any time. In light of that morning, I vowed to face my own tradition, Judaism, and my own tradition, sacred biblical writings on violence. I wanted to know the extent of such violence, what were its consequences, and if counter voices existed within biblical narratives. But since violence and aggression in the Hebrew Bible were most often directed at other peoples, though occasionally at other Israelites, I quickly realized I had to situate a study of violence and a larger analysis of Israelites and other peoples. Sadly, I believe such an analysis of ancient Israelites and their neighbors remains as pertinent today as it did when I began my work a decade ago. <sighs> we certainly have many challenges, don't we? Coming out of or still in a pandemic, depending on the month or the week, climate change and environmental injustice that's getting worse day by day, anti-Semitism, racism, social, cultural, and political fragmentation and polarization. And if that is not enough, we are now living literally right now in the midst of a major conflict again. Violence against one's neighbors is an ongoing fact as made tragically clear by the Russian invasion of Ukraine and a senseless war that is still going on. At times, it appears that human behavior doesn't change that much. In spite of the extraordinary progress in many areas, our world, at least in this particular period, is not that removed 
from the realities faced by the peoples of the ancient Near East. Numerous biblical stories describe an us versus them. But here's the thing. Just as many stories I discovered in the Bible describe us and them. To do so wasn't a luxury, wasn't just a progressive wish, but it was actually a necessity for our biblical writers. Why? Why was us and them such a necessity? The people Israel lived in a land inhabited and surrounded by others who could not be written out of existence. And to be really clear here, I'm talking about ancient Israel that was founded somewhere around the time of 1000 BCE. Um, and, you know, finally they went into first, uh, first exile around 586 BCE. So I'm talking about many, many, many thousands of years ago. I'm not talking about modern day Israel, but the children of Israel in the Bible, the Am Yisrael, are called Israelites by biblical scholars. So that's who I'm referring to. I just wanted to be really clear because I'm talking about back then. But as you'll hear a little bit from time to time, I'm also thinking about our situation. And I'm happy to speak more uh, in the Q&A. I will also say I'm not a political scientist. I'm not an a expert on, on modern Israel or the modern Near East, but I am somewhat of an expert in a humble way on that ancient period, um, again, thousands of years ago. The people Israel in that time lived in a land inhabited and surrounded by others who would not, could not be written out of existence. Imagine Imagine that area. They were surrounded sometimes within their borders by Canaanites, Midianites, Philistines, Phoenicians, Arameans, and some of these peoples were adver adversaries. Some of them were allies, sometimes um, both in different periods, competitors or partners. Sometimes enemy would become an ally. Sometimes a friend could become a foe. Therefore, Israelites over the period in which the Bible was written and recorded and preserved held a range of attitudes towards those outsiders from avoidance to curiosity, from distrust to desire, from rejection to welcome. At times the Israelites reacted violently to their neighbors. Others among them found a way not only to coexist but to thrive in relationship to other peoples. Biblical texts served as a record of the possibilities and also as a warning and a guide for future dealings. In some ways, it could be considered a model for the complexities of our world as well as its own. As you may already tell, I'm not a literalist, but I do recognize the strong cultural influence that the Bible uh, has in our contemporary times. It's a text that still has a power and an influence over what goes on uh, in our world, in the United States, in the Middle East, uh, also in Europe, Africa. Uh, I know people from Australia, New Zealand. I mean, it is a universal text, this Bible. I do want to say when I talk about it, I call it in English the Hebrew Bible. In Hebrew, of course, it's the Tanakh, Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim. Um, but I call it the Hebrew Bible instead of the Old Testament because I'm differentiating between the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, which I do not talk about and I am not a specialist in. My period is really the Hebrew Bible. Um, in its final form, this Hebrew Bible that I love very much preserves multiple points of view and a decent amount of nuance. I think this last point often does go unnoticed, but it's crucial in helping us think more clearly about Israelites and their neighbors. It may also help us think in our time to think more clearly about the interconnections we experience with those around us in this country, in Israel, in the world. Before jumping into the two somewhat surprising stories of Israelites and their neighbors that I have selected to talk, talk to you about this evening, let me offer you my conclusion. So I'm jumping right to the end. You don't have to leave because I have to get you there, but I'll tell you right now that many stories in the Hebrew Bible or the Tanakh argue that coexistence with other peoples is absolutely necessary, beneficial, and even deeply longed for. That longing is beautifully and famously expressed by my favorite biblical prophet Isaiah in chapter 2, verse 4 of his prophecy. This is a famous line. I'm just bringing it up as the context for our conversation tonight. 
He wrote back then, they, the many peoples, shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not take up sword against nation, nor shall they learn or study war anymore. Amen. May that be a blessing and a prayer and a hope. Of course, until that vision is actualized, Israelites way back then in the years, now I'm talking about probably, I don't know, 900 to maybe 400 BCE, so 500 years of the biblical period, Israelites had no choice but to be alert to the threats from the outside. But they also needed to seek alternatives to constant conflict in their times. Ultimately, pragmatically, they could not ignore that they lived among other peoples who they would never permanently defeat. We don't have to search very far in the Torah to discover such a nuanced awareness of the reality of all these other peoples who surrounded ancient Israel. Let's start with Abraham. Called by God, he sets out on a journey at the end of Genesis 11, whose destination is unknown. I imagine him wary, perhaps vulnerable. He leaves behind his birthplace and home to travel for months, possibly years, through unfamiliar Mesopotamian territory, modern day Iraq, Iran. He eventually moves on to the land God shows him, only to discover a mere four verses later that famine necessitates a hasty departure to Egypt, a potentially hostile and dangerous region. Seemingly always on the road, now and forevermore, Abraham is a stranger in a world he does not know. He encounters a powerful pharaoh, numerous kings, a crafty priest of El Elyon, the wicked townspeople of Sodom and Gomorrah. Without property of his own, he is forced to bargain with the townspeople to gain, I'm sorry, a piece of ground in which to bury his wife. Having quickly learned the challenges and especially the perils of being uprooted, Abraham must urgently distinguish between those who wish him harm and those who do not. His is not an easy task, but it is a necessary one. More important even than obtaining wealth or territory, Abraham must try to understand the countless strangers that he meets along the way and those who live just beyond his tent, beyond his gate. The biblical stories of his life preserve that hard-earned knowledge. That's Abraham. Years later, his descendants, the people Israel, find themselves in a similar situation. They too need to understand a world of strangers, first in Egypt, like their ancestor, then during an equally fought journey back through the wilderness to the promised land. But even after crossing the River Jordan and finally arriving as Abraham had in the promised land, the Israelites must continue to live alongside others build relationships with them and seek to understand, outwit, or befriend them, or sometimes all of the above, I imagine. The literary record of such relationships is preserved by our biblical writers in compelling and at times surprising narratives of these Israelites from long ago and their neighbors. So let me now share with you just two stories tonight from that literary record. One focused on the threat of violence in the book of Joshua, the other a story from the book of Kings that invites the reader to shift from ridicule and mockery to appreciation of an outsider. In each story, the presence of outsiders do force their Israelite counterparts to reconsider what they thought they understood about their enemies who happened largely to live right next door. As I describe each of these stories to you in what is famously called a close, careful reading of a particular text, let me stop along the way here and there to point out to you how the writer is leading me and perhaps you to an interpretation or a message that the writer was eager to get across. And I will end this talk with a very brief comment on how these biblical tales might be of use to us in the world in which we find ourselves. Tonight, I chose not to put a text up on the screen for you, just to have you see me. So there's a little bit more connection between us. I will mention, mention the chapters and verses that these stories come from. Uh, and you can certainly go back and reread them yourselves if, you're, if your interest is piqued and your curiosity. Um, I'm going to talk about them in English. I'm going to give you asides about what I think is happening in them and what communication they're uh, 
presenting to us. And as I said at the beginning, if you have any questions or comments, please make sure to jot them down and we can come back to them. So I will stop and try to um, highlight some of the literary artistry of the um, writers. And as you can tell, I am a literary scholar of the Bible. That's the particular um, point that I come to the Bible from. I'm interested in storytelling. I'm interested in narrative. I love poetry. You can't not love poetry if you read the prophets. So I will re read for you these stories. But in these stories, I hope you understand that the writers are really thinking about and sorting out how to live with each other um, and, and some of the assumptions that they make that need to be clarified and some of the assumptions and stereotypes that we might hold as we read these stories. I'm gonna put it all out there for you um, in as clear a way as possible. And again, I'm going to end this talk with just a very brief comment about how these tales might help us think about where we're at in the world ourselves. So here we go. The first example comes from the book of Joshua, and it's about a particular people who are not Israelites, who are probably very, very ancient in the land, uh, and they are called in English the Anakites, or in Hebrew, Ha'anakim, Ha'anak. You might realize You'll uh, be familiar with them. They make an appearance in our Torah cycle in the book of Numbers and in the book of Deuteronomy, which I will come back to um, in just a minute. Uh, but let me begin by telling you that this first story from the book of Joshua details the crossing over from the wilderness into the land after Moses died, right? So we're done with Deuteronomy and the five books, and now we're moving into the book of Joshua. And at that time, Joshua is now in charge. Moses sadly died in the wilderness and did not cross over with them. Joshua is the successor and is in charge. Uh, excessive violence in a campaign begun by divine command turns out to be both impossible and undesirable at this stage in the story. So they are told they have to conquer the land, they get ready to conquer the land. It takes much longer than they think it will. And in the end, we discover they're not actually fully successful in their task. None other than Joshua, who is the commander of the Israelite army, comes to rethink this goal and rethink his enemy in more sober and careful ways. There's no triumphalism here. Sometimes people think Joshua is a triumphalist book. If you read it really slowly, which I did when I was doing my research, I was very interested in how complex a book it turned out to be. And I will argue that these stories of the sons of Anak appear they're cautionary, illustrating a growing recognition of the limits of such triumph triumphalist military conquerors, both for Israel and more importantly, I think for the writers in the book of Joshua. I'll just say as an aside um, that these books were probably originally stories. You know, I always tell my students, imagine people sitting around a campfire telling good stories at night. They hear these stories, they pass them on. At some point, they're collected. They are written down uh, over, over maybe 100 years, 200 years, and they're put into the final version that we have in our Torah. So there's a lot of um, interesting uh, insertions and changes and thought going into these stories as, uh, as we have them now. So the Anakites are first mentioned in Joshua in chapter 11. Now I will quote, he has managed to take all this land, the hills and all the Negev and all the land of Goshen and the lowlands and the desert and the hills and the coastal plain, even to Har Hermon, Mount Hermon. This is in chapter 11 of Joshua verses 16 and 17. The list covers the promised land almost in its entirety from south to north. But the narrator acknowledges that the war has taken far too long while the conquest remains incomplete. Even so, in 11 verse 21, Joshua seems to successfully attack and expel the Anakites. Who are these Anakites, you might wonder? They are a tribe of giants. Anak means giant. Let's look quickly at their backstory in the books of Numbers and Deuteronomy. We first meet the Anakites in the unfortunate episode of the spies in the book of Numbers. Moses sends 12 men, including Joshua and Caleb, who you'll hear again in a moment, to scout out the promised land in Numbers 13 and preparation for its conquest. 
quote from Numbers 13, verse 22. They went up into the Negev, they came to Hebron, and there were Achiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the children of Anak. The story, as you know, did not end well for the scouts. Seeing the giants led to their failure of will and the eventual punishment of the entire generation freed from Egypt, including Miriam, Aaron, and Moses, all of whom died off in the wilderness. Only Joshua and Caleb remain to lead the next generation into the land in the book of Joshua. The Anakites again appear in Moses' retelling of that difficult wilderness journey in Deuteronomy. They are the yardstick against which Moses compares the other powerful peoples they encounter. The Anakites are described in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, and again in verse 21, as Riphaim, another word for giants, again emphasizing their status as intimidating figures, as intimidating giants. By using these two terms for giants, the writer goes out of his way to illustrate the threat that they present to the newly formed people of Israel. The Anakites stand out in Moses' memory literally as well as figuratively due to their exceptional power, their numbers, and their height. In fact, when Moses urges the people to prepare themselves to conquer the land, he does warn them of the challenge, especially in confronting, quote, a people great and tall, the sons of the Anakites, who you know, for you have heard, who can stand up against the sons of Anak? And that is in kind of quotation marks in the Bible, too. That's, that signals it's a kind of aphor, aphorism or a kind of parable. Who can stand up against the sons of Anak? Who indeed? Moses' rhetorical question haunts Joshua and Caleb as they're in the land. It is left to these two years later, as recorded in the book of Joshua, to try to answer that question in the affirmative. But as we shall see, they will fail to do so. Now we're back in the book of Joshua after that little detour to Numbers and uh, Deuteronomy, Midbar, but Midbar and Devarim. Now we're back in the book of Joshua or Yehoshua. We're back in chapter 11, and it describes how Joshua destroys the settlements of the Anakites in the hill country, from Hebron, Devir, and Anav, from the hills of Judah to those of Israel. The statement is quite thorough. No Anakites remained in the land of the children of Israel. Only in Gaza, Gat, and Ashdod did they remain. Joshua 11, verse 22. So in other words, Joshua's victory sounds comprehensive, especially since it follows the record of his vast successes in taking many other territories. And yet, the second phrase sounds an alarm. The Anakites remain alive and quite nearby, surviving in cities associated with the Philistines, the enemies of the Israelites for some time to come. The Anakites are mentioned again in Joshua 14, but not in the location we would have expected to find them from Joshua 11 in the Philistine territory. No, no. Now in Joshua 14, verse 12, Caleb reports that they are still in the hill country. He must fight them as he promised God many years earlier Why he and Joshua were still in the wilderness. Quote, for you heard in that day that the Anakites were there and great fortified cities. Perhaps God will be with me and I shall dispossess, dispossess them as God had said. Unquote. But hasn't Joshua already done that? Apparently not. So now, and again in chapter 15, it's Caleb who must try to dislodge the three children of Anak from Hebron, exactly the same that were named in Numbers 13, Sheshai, Achiman, and Talmai, precisely the Anakites he encountered way back in Numbers. So how are these giants still there where we thought they had been um, evacuated from the land? Didn't Joshua get rid of them in chapter 11? The contradictory references to them, in good biblical scholarly fashion, I could suggest an alternative tradition. This might be, there's a story about Joshua, there's a story about Caleb, they were both preserved. And in these stories, it's Caleb, not Joshua, who plays the crucial role. That is one thing a biblical scholar would suggest to you, and it's probably uh, based on good evidence that there was a tradition about Caleb, a tradition about Joshua, and so they, you know, cut the difference and put them together in this final version. That's plausible and even possible, but 
There's other ways to go on from that to something I think a lot more interesting. If you read it as it was preserved, it wasn't just preserved to, to kind of keep these stories there. It was preserved because these stories together might give you a different and interesting message about what's happening right then in that land. Chapters 14 and 15 function literarily to confirm that the Anakites continued in the land, they were still a presence in that land. And in so doing, the second reference to the Anakites reveals, I think, an anxiety within the narratives toward a people whose memory was so powerful that it endured through the entire 40 years of the wandering in the wilderness, haunting Moses, remember, back then in Deuteronomy, and now still haunting Joshua and Caleb, even after many years of war in the land. The abundance of details and the number of references suggests that the Anakites cannot be destroyed. Either they persist in Philistine territory, or worse, they resurface in the hill country of Judah, even though Joshua apparently rid the land of them. Perhaps the Israelites are not as invincible as they thought. Strangers such as the Anakites might yet prove too strong for them. Their persistence in these texts represent a power and a permanence that the Israelites fear perhaps they themselves did not possess, revealing is the Israelite inability to conquer the promised land in its entirety, as they had been tasked with doing. I would argue that the Anakites stand in, actually, in these stories for all those enemies who were not able to be expelled or extinguished. In other words, uh, Joshua, the book of Judges, the books of uh, Samuel, the books of Kings, Israelites are continuing to live in land that they share with other peoples, even within the borders of the land of Israel. An epilogue to this story of the Anakites actually substantiates their continuing presence in the book of Judges that comes right after Joshua. In that book of Judges, the narrator describes the battle by the Judahites, no longer Caleb, but the Judahites against none other than Sheshai, Achiman, and Talmai, still in Hebron, but this time after the death of Joshua. So not only do the Anakites counter the dream of a complete conquest of the land, but I think they are a recurring nightmare. They provide the crack in a triumphalist story of conquest, offering Israelites a more sober realism about the ongoing conflict that they might face in that area of the world, as, by the way, they would face in many other areas. I mean, this is the ancient world we're talking about. There was many conflicts over territory, over uh, land, etc. But this is a story of ancient Israel that we're sharing tonight. So my second story this evening is a surprising and positive encounter between Naaman the Aramean and the prophet Elisha. Their story dissolves stereotypes, giving way to the nuance and complexity of human interaction. So I should say in the first story, what I did is I read a few different chapters in Joshua about the same uh, characters and the same topic, and I wove them together to present you with a final kind of interpretation. Here, I'm just reading one chapter, and it's a complete story from start to finish. So this is more familiar territory in, in terms of what we know of short stories. This is more or less a short story, this story of Naaman the Aramean and the prophet Elisha, and I think it's a, it's a great one, which is why I'm going to retell it tonight. So Naaman is rather abruptly introduced as the head of the Aramean army in the second book of Kings, chapter five, verse one, quote, a great man before his Lord elevated in favor since through him Adonai, which I will call yod heh vav -Hey, Yahweh, the Israelite king tonight, I will call that figure Adonai, uh, who gave victory to Aram. I'll read that again. A great man before his Lord, his king, elevated in favor since through him Adonai gave victory to Aram, and Naaman was a great rep warrior, a leper. That's the first verse of his story. Great warrior, a leper. What a mixed description. When one reads a first verse like that, 
certainly behooves you as the reader to pay attention to details. In other words, why are we being told precisely what we're being told? Why is he a leper? Since I've read a lot of literary stories in the Bible, I can tell you that word leper is not all that common. And if it's in the first verse, it must have an important role to play in the story. And it will, as we shall see. So first we learn Naaman is an enemy warrior of great distinction that God uh, uses to allow Aram, a sometime enemy of Israel, victory. Another scholar of the Bible, Frank Spina, explains the effect that that verse might have on the readers. This notation about God's positive involvement with Naaman and Aram has the effect of reorienting the reader. It's a very complicated issue here, uh, which I really don't have time to go into in great depth, but I will simply say that at a certain point, when the enemies of Israelites ended up defeating Israel, the prophets went out of their way to try to convince their audience, the Israelites, that God must have had this in God's plan, that God uses these other peoples for some purpose that has to be discerned, usually by the prophets. Um, so when this happens, it's actually not uncommon to understand that perhaps God is behind this. We don't know why, we, um, but we do. And it's not even that important, by the way, in, um, in this particular story. But I just wanted to explain that to you because it's a little weird. Aram seems to be an enemy, but we will see that God has other ideas for him. And actually, he in the end becomes a friend. The intricacy of this plot does allow for a really layered characterization of Naaman, and I think those layers actually humanize him for us. So, for instance, still in verse one, we do learn that this warrior is a leper. His description juxtaposes his power, his status, with a certain kind of physical vulnerability as a leper. Power and status have their limits if they can't protect him from leprosy, right? Um, so illness here is also something, leprosy is a funny, is a, sometimes I know too much, I don't have to tell you that, leprosy is something that you would want to avoid because they thought it might be contagious, we know all about contagious diseases now, unfortunately, so it's also strange what is Naaman doing among his people as a leper, but he is, and we just have to go with it and try to figure it out. Verse three adds another note to this tale, which is somewhat negative. The Arameans are now raiding sites in Northern Israel. As a result of Aram's aggression, an Israelite girl is even taken captive and placed in Naaman's house. So these verses do suggest the extent to which the Arameans would disrupt the daily lives of the Israelites. If you can imagine Northern Israel, uh, the Aram area is somewhere around the border with Syria and Lebanon up in that area. That's where uh, different towns of the Arameans were probably settled in those years long ago. This is probably... I'm trying to think, maybe 700, 600, no, uh, I always go backwards, 800 BCE, something like that. The story, though, goes on to illustrate the positive influence of this one Israelite captive, this little girl, on her Aramean master. The young girl, learning of Naaman's leprosy, exclaims to her mistress, Oh, would that my Lord were before the prophet in Shamron, so that he would cure his leprosy. Uh, verse 3, the same verse. Her portrait, however terse, it's very brief, she shows up, she makes that line, and then you don't know much more about her after that. It's rather extraordinary, however. Even in her servitude, she does not lose her capacity for compassion, for being humane. And by facilitating Naaman's cure, this little Israelite girl who we know nothing about sets the tale in motion. Uh, and turns this enemy warrior into some kind of ally, as we shall see, of the Israelites. So servant also, later in the tale, will play another important role. So look at who these various characters are, almost like a play, right? You have the warrior, you have the little girl, servant girl, you have um, servants, you will about to have a king and a prophet. The king of Aram sends Naaman with a straightforward letter to the king of Israel, quoting from the same chapter, verses six and seven. I sent to you Naaman, says the king of Aram, my servant, so that you cure his leprosy. And it was when the king of Israel read that letter, he tore his clothes and he said, am I God 
to kill or to give life that this one sends to me to cure a man from his leprosy? But so no, please, and see, he must seek a quarrel with me. So this king does not believe that this is actually a legitimate, legitimate request. And he's quite sure he doesn't know how to cure his leprosy and he probably will provoke a war and he's in a terrible pickle. So when faced with such a request, this king of Israel panics. Thus does the writer have us see the contrast right away. Remember the calm Israelite, Israelite girl, go to the prophet in Israel. He will cure you. And this king who doesn't even think of the prophet, who doesn't even know what to do, right? His panic is then juxtaposed with her calm as he rushes to the worst possible scenario that the Arameans must be tricking him. Spiner, again, this Frank Spiner I mentioned before, highlights this negative assessment. He says, the Israelite king's actions indicate that he has no more insight into the nature of the situation than do the Arameans. He never once thinks of the prophet who is in Shimron from the Israelite king's vantage point. Neither he nor Israel is any more capable of dealing with Naaman's condition than are the Aramean king or the Arameans. The prophet Elisha, on the other hand, identifies the Israelite king's ignorance of his powers. He knows that he's been overlooked by this king, and he demands of the king to send Naaman to him so that both the king of Israel and the Aramean commander can know that there is a prophet in Israel whose name is Elisha, direct successor from Elijah, who is the better known prophet for a lot of reasons, but Elisha is playing a big role in this particular story. So think about it. I've only told you about eight verses of this story of Naaman. And look at the ease in which the complexity of all this cast of characters is created. We have a leprous warrior. We have a calm and industrious servant girl. We have a panicked king of Israel who is subject to some ridic ridicule. And we also have an indignant prophet in just eight verses. Um, that's one of the things I really love about the Bible, that it's so easy in its kind of sparseness to be filled in by the details that it offers you. The scene shifts to the opening of Elisha's house. Naaman arrives with his chariot and his horses, a sign of worldly power, um, even though that power failed to protect him against his illness, but he brings it along with him. Standing in Elisha's doorway, Naaman is on the verge of a cure. Elisha instructs him via a messenger to cure himself by bathing seven times in the river Jordan. But the commander's pride gets in the way. Naaman can't take yes for an answer, angrily rejecting the cure as too simple. As the story goes on to describe it in Kings 5 verses 11 through 12, Naaman was furious and he left saying, Look, I thought to myself, he would surely come out and stand and call in the name of Adonai, his God, and wave his hand toward the place and cure the leprosy. Are not my rivers of Damascus, the Amana and the Farpar, better than all the rivers of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be purified? And he turned and went off in a fury. He has very clear expectations, apparently, of prophetic ritual. I think he thinks this is how it should go. And the syntax of the sentence even conveys his fury to myself, he says, right? He's announcing his expectation that the prophet would at least show him the respect of speaking directly to him and not through a messenger. Naaman has not recognized that by coming to Elisha, he has placed himself at his mercy. The commander both misunderstands the source of the prophet's powers, and doubts its efficacy. Feeling humiliated, feeling demeaned, he finds a way to reassert his superiority by preferring his own rivers of Damascus to the exclusive source of healing in this tale, the River Jordan. Naaman's response illustrates how personal and national pride may block openness to other peoples and to the benefit of at least some of their practices. Such pride almost leads him to walk away from the cure that he came so far to obtain. Luckily for Naaman, he has servants who know how to craft an argument that can persuade their master. He does listen to his servants. We already learned that with the young Israelite girl. These servants, presumably Arameans, though I don't know for sure, they just called them, I think, I don't have the text directly in front of me, uh, just his servants, they address his common sense. 
since he is desperate enough to accept instructions from Alicia in the first place, why not try something as easy as bathing in the Jordan? What's, what could her new? The commander defers to his subordinates as he did with the young Israelite girl back in Aram. He's cured as soon as he follows Alicia's exact instructions. Free of his onerous illness, Naaman gratefully returns to the prophet with gifts that Alicia refuses to accept. Unfazed, Naaman expresses his great fealty, his great loyalty to Adonai, our God, Yodhevave. If not, if not, if you don't let, if you don't accept these gifts, at least let me take two mule loads of earth. Let that be given to your servant Naaman so that your servant will never again offer up burnt offering or sacrifice to other gods except to Yahweh, Adonai, Yerevave. But for one thing, may God forgive your servant. When my master, the king of Aram, comes to the house of Ramon in Damascus and bows low, and he leans on my arm so that I also have to bow low in the house of Ramon, when I bow in the house of Ramon, may God forgive your servant in this thing. And um, Alicia says to him, go in peace. And he rent from him some distance. Now, let me uh, just break that apart a little bit before the next uh, interesting encounter just in a minute. So what a change a cure can make. Now I'm on grasp the moral of the story, a knowledge already expressed at its beginning by the young Israelite girl. The real power among the Israelites lies with their prophet and ultimately with the Israelite God. To reinforce that point, Naaman uses the word servant five times for himself. He is now the servant in, in these uh, verses of 15 through 18, clearly taking upon himself that role, not only as a servant to the prophet, but as a servant to God, which is really the way that the Bible actually thinks of Israelites. We are God's servants. We work for God in the world and trying to make the world a better place. Rather, he's, called, he's seeing them as his God rather than his own king of Amman in Damascus. The passage also illustrates his ability to think ahead as he anticipates a scene after his return to the Aramean court. In rather meticulous fashion, Naaman obtains Elisha's pre-approval of his need to deceive his king as the situation dictates, thereby protecting Naaman's loyalty to God, his integrity, and his life. He's thinking of it. He's shrewd. He wants to preserve his worship of this God of Israel, but he's in the court of the king of Aram, and he doesn't want to get killed. And actually, I'm pretty sure later in the story, he is um, seen, I don't think they name him specifically, but if I remember correctly in my book, I established that he might have even ended up a spy for the northern Israel by being in the, in the um, throne room of the king of Aram. Anyways, the point of this story is he is um, a servant to the God of the Israelites. The depth of his commitment gratifies not only Elisha, but I believe the Israelite audience hearing this tale would feel pretty good about it. Identified as a favorite of the king of Aram, if you remember, when he was first introduced, his devoted preference for God carries extra weight. His story highlights the possibility that a stranger, even one as mighty as the commander of an enemy army, can become a follower of the Israelite God. His portrait also, I think, brilliantly humanizes an enemy and turns him into a welcomed ally, maybe even a friend. Of course, the depth of that welcome relies on the stranger's willingness to acknowledge God's superiority. It is the Bible, right? They want him to recognize the superiority of God instead of his own God. But at the same time, the story, story suggests that Elisha is willing, Elisha, the prophet, is willing to heal this enemy commander even before he takes an oath to the Israelite God. Okay, that was a little confusing. He takes his oath, but before he does that, Elisha the Israelite already heals him, right? He doesn't know that he's going to take that oath. He hopes, I assume, but he doesn't know it. But Elisha and uh, the um, Aramean are now worshipers of the same God together. So I think, you know, for an Israelite audience, that would feel really good. Uh, but uh, it might be less pleasing for the Aramean audience if they heard this tale, obviously, to hear that the Israelite God is more superior to the king of Aram and the Aramean God.
the story is not quite done. I know we are, yes, oh, running out of time. So I will give you the ending, which is really, um, and then try to pull it all together. So I think I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit because I think I need to end in just a few minutes, uh, um, but you wanna know. Dr. 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 We actually have till 8.30 if you, so you have plenty of time. Oh, okay. Good. Then I'll tell you the rest of the story, but I still want time for answers. I mean, questions yeah. for answers and answers <laughs> and questions. So put your questions in the chat, please. Um, the story isn't done. Now, Amon the Aramean also becomes the means through which a biblical writer can satirically and criticize the Israelite king, as we saw for his panic, but also the servant of Elisha the prophet. By weighing in on the side of the prophet, Naaman places the behavior of the Israelite king who ignores, rejects God's prophet, forgets about him. Not so Naaman. He, he is now, you know, a, a uh, ally of this prophet. And the tale's ending, which we're about to get to, dilutes any Israelite smugness over this whole story because the servant of the prophet Gehazi, his name is Gehazi, is depicted as a corrupt and greedy liar, thus throwing the valiant Naaman's integrity into very sharp relief. So how, how does this happen? Gehazi follows the Aramean commander after he leaves the prophet's presence with his eye on the gifts that the prophet had rejected. So these two encounters, that of Naaman and Elisha, and now that of Naaman and Gehazi are radically different capturing alternative possibilities for how an Israelite and an Aramean may relate to one another, one with honor and respect, the other with cunning and a certain kind of lie. He lies. Gehazi will lie. Gehazi exploits Naaman's gratitude. After lying about the needs of Elisha's young disciples, he says, oh, we need that for the disciples. Elisha forgot. He easily convinces the Aramean to give him the silver and the clothing. Gehazi pockets the money for himself, and then he goes back to his master, the prophet Elisha, lying. Elisha is not deceived. He's a prophet, after all. And he says, is this a time to take money? The leprosy of Naaman will cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from before this uh, figure who was leprous like snow. So the ending of the story is Gehazi is the one who ends up with le uh, leprosy. And that rebuke further elevates the Aramean by denigrating the Israelite servant. The point is made in literary fashion. Again, the word leper, if you remember, starts the story in chapter 5, verse 1. And now it ends the story in chapter 5, verse 27. Gehazi really has been cast from the inside out, this Israelite. Now Amman's story complicates the dichotomy between Israelite and stranger by valuing sagacious, wise behavior more than ethnic or national identity. The female Israelite servant and the Aramean servants of Naaman pave the way for his cure. While an Israelite king is ineffectual and an Israelite servant corrupt and duplicitous. Yet ethne, eth, sorry. Ethnicity does still play a role. As an Aramean, Naaman reinforces the credibility and the stature of the Israelite prophet Elisha and the superiority of God. By the end of this tale, it is hard to maintain stereotypes. One has a fuller, richer picture of Naaman the Aramean and perhaps admires him, I do, but scorns Gehazi the Israelite. Taken together, these two stories of the Anakites and the Arameans illustrate that strangers within Israel's borders and those from the outside are of great interest to the biblical writers. The authority of a significant leader in Israel, commander or prophet, sanctions the outcome of each of these stories, the one in Joshua and the one in Kings, about the giants, the Anakites, and the Arameans. Remember that first story forces the reader and Joshua, for that matter, to realize that an over-reliance on violence can only lead to unceasing conflict. The recurring presence of the Anakites illustrates the limits of violence and warns against the folly of assuming its efficacy in ridding the land of other peoples. 
And a recent essay by Jonathan Haidt, H-A-I-D-T, I believe it was in the Atlanta, on the dangerous and pervasive divisions in our time fed by social media. He suggests that societies need ways in which to build in mechanisms that might slow things down, that might cool passions, that might require compromise. That's a quote from him. I would say also reflection, also take a breath. I believe that these biblical narratives aim to do that. They aim to slow things down by telling their stories, perhaps to cool your passions, to demand compromise in order to move the Israelites of that time in the Bible away from constant conflict with other peoples and perhaps also among themselves. I, you know, there are, there are many stories I could talk about. There are a number of them where the Northern Israelites and the Southern Israelites actually battle each other. So, you know, there's conflict all around. And this second story that I just spent a lot of time retelling, Elisha the prophet exemplifies uh, this, this way of learning how to slow down, cool passions, demand compromise by healing Naaman the Aramean instead of treating him as an enemy, treats him as a human being who needs a healing. In so doing, Elisha succeeds in turning a warrior enemy, a commander, into an ally. So here are just some concluding thoughts for all of us. Readings in numerous other biblical stories that I read in, I'll show you my book again, uh, came out in 2017, that biblical writers considered not only how to protect themselves from their enemies or how to fight against them, or, but also how to move enemies from strangers into neighbors so that they could coexist in peace. And the end of the many rich and suspenseful, tragic, surprising, even weird stories that I read, including the two I described tonight, you realize, you discover that they really avoided a strict ideological stance of us versus them. There was plenty of that, but that wasn't the only stance. There was also plenty of us and them. Us and them. Biblical writers were realistic in their stories by depicting and preserving a continuum of attitudes towards other peoples, which often enough made space for Israelites to turn strangers into neighbors, enemies into friends. How? We've seen some of that tonight, by getting to know them, by getting to know the strangers at their gates, whether through happenstance or actually historically we learn that there were very many shared interests such as mutually beneficial trade between Israelites and Philistines for iron implements as agricultural tools, or King Solomon in building his famous temple relied on and hired skillful builders and beautiful cedar lumber from the king of Haram, who happened to be a friend of his, to build the very house of God. Such contacts between Israelites and other peoples led at least some biblical writers to recognize the benefits of cross-pollination in cultural and intellectual exchanges, to urge generosity and compassion to others when called for rather than hostility, or simply to avoid a polarization that binds a people to unceasing and unwinnable conflict. To do so, skillful and artful biblical writers rely on nuance and complexity to tell you really great stories that reduce caricature, reduce stereotype, just as we've seen. You know, I, I said this, I didn't say that just now, but I will say it to you now as I think of it. I really believe that's why um, the literary um, version of these stories that are all over the Bible, why they chose a literary attempt, because they could, you can't write a good story without fleshing out and developing, you can, you can have bad people, good people, but it's not as good a story. You wanna create ambigu ambiguity, you wanna know more about their mod motives, you wanna know who they are, what they've experienced, what they think. You don't get all of that, but you get enough of that that it made me realize that's why a lot of these writers told stories, right? To, to give you their, their communication and their moral. There's plenty of law, there's poetry, there's all sorts of genres in the Bible, which I'm happy to go into in the Q&A, but there are lots of narratives as well. And they choose those narratives because they can create complexity. And the biblical writers are nothing if not complex. 
and nuanced in these stories. And I think, you know, eventually, as I said, these stories come down through time until they're woven together into all these stories that are preserved. And as they're preserved, they become part of a sacred an authoritative record. That's what the Torah becomes, a sacred and authoritative record, but preserved in that record is this continuum of possibilities, of alternatives, of views, of lessons learned, of warnings, of promise and hope and vision. And what is the result for us, I think? A sweeping conversation, breathtaking in scope, that easily encompasses multiple narratives of Israelites and their strangers at their gate. In its final form, the Hebrew Bible presents later readers, including us, the choice between rejection and tolerance, violence and peace. It might even encourage a different sort of future. May it happen speedily in our time with our neighbors. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Levine. There's a very engaging and insightful lecture. I really uh, appreciate your reading of the, of the text through this literary lens that's illuminating uh, important insights, many of which I haven't heard myself, and I'm sure our participants also uh, gain, gain much new insight for themselves. Um, I have a, a few questions here. There's a mix of questions that are directly related to sort of your, your thesis for the evening and some more broadly about um, texts. And um, so I'll I'll begin with, with one that, that's directly related to your thesis there. And it, the question is, and you don't have to necessarily go into detail, but are there other examples of, um, like, like, like the one you presented, or if you want to mention a few others for people to be able to, to research on their own of, of this, as this person said, friendship uh, between the Israelites or, or ways they learned from each other. Um, I know you mentioned a few with the temple and such, but uh, maybe you can um, cite a few. Examples between Israelites and other peoples, not yeah. not among themselves. <laughs> Sorry, good yeah. to know that Israelites have friendships between themselves. They do. David and Jonathan, for instance. Um, you know, the most famous story that I've written about is Jethro, um, who is a Midianite priest, but he's also father-in-law of Moses. Uh, in chapter eighteen of Exodus, they become. Uh, before, you know, so Exodus chapter 19 is a very important chapter. That's when revelation happens. God comes down on the top of the mountain and gives Moses the Torah. The chapter right before that, uh, Jethro the Midianite pays Moses a visit and sees how disorganized he is with all these thousands of people trying to get his advice. And he says, you can't do this. You're going to wear yourself out. Let me help you set up basically a judiciary, a way of solving these problems, creating, you know, picking all these people. And he has all these, um, all these uh, traits that these people need to be honest, to be, um, you know, mutual, to be loyal, to believe in God, right, whatever. Jethro really helps them pick out the very best of the people to, in, to aid Moses in adjudicating all the issues. That happens before the law is even given to them. And the understanding here is that this Midianite priest, maybe with more experience, he was, you know, he was a priest in his own, in his own tribe, maybe he knows something, and he sees that Moses needs his help, and they do that um, in order to create a way for the law, once they get it from God, to really be adjudicated among the people. That's like a big, you know, a pretty big example. Um, Hagar, who is an Egyptian uh, in Genesis, uh, plays a very big role. I don't know if people realize this, but she's the first female in Genesis to actually see and name God. She calls God El Royi in Genesis 16. And then she also has another uh, round of revelation with God in Genesis 21 with Ishmael. So she plays a very important role. I could go on and on, obviously, um, uh, if you want, but those are just two that easily pop to mind to me. I guess Balaam, you know, is not exactly a friend to Israel, but he can't curse Israel. And in fact, a later audience, this is in the book of Numbers, you know, you know the story, it's famous of Balaam with the donkey and the donkey keeps seeing the messenger from God. Um, and finally that messenger says to uh, Balaam, you have to go bless the people. You can't curse these people. So he goes and he blesses them. And it's at a point during the wilderness journey where the people have very bad morale. They feel very um, depressed because, you know, a whole generation is going to be denied entry to the promised land. And it takes Balaam, who happens to be a Midianite as well, I believe, 
Moab, uh, let's see, Balak is a Moabite in Balaam, I think. I, I'd have to look. I'm sorry. I should know it, but it's popped out of my mind. Anyways, he is definitely a big prophet and an outsider. He says, Yisrael, right? We sing that every day in Shul. If we go to Shul, every Shabbat, you know, he's saying, how great are your tents in a, in a time that Israel can't see, it, see that for themselves. Three examples. Thank you. Those are, uh, are great examples, I'm sure. If, any, if, if anyone out there hasn't read the story, isn't familiar with the story of uh, Balaam and his uh, donkey, that's uh, a great one to, uh, to catch up on sometime. Um, I have several questions um, asking about how, you, how, your, how your reading takes into account um, Adonai's command to destroy the enemy, in, which in this case, or, or the vendettas against the, uh, the Anakites, like how, how, how do you reconcile those in your reading? Well, I mean, I think the Anakites survived is, is one of the points there, right? That they, they outfoxed the Israelites, actually. Um, it's a very difficult, and as I said, that's why I, I wrote this book. I really wanted to investigate the violence. There's all sorts of violence. There's violence against other peoples. There's violence against biblical women, you know, Israelite women. We haven't even talked about that one. There's plenty of that too. And the point is, you know, I do, I do an exercise with my rabbinical students. I think also I teach rabbinical and cantorial students at the Hebrew Union College. Um, and I always do an exercise with the first chapter of Hosea. That is a pretty difficult chapter um, in which, you know, God says, take a woman as a, take a whore, uh, and marry her, treat and tr treats her with great abuse. It's a terrible, it's a terrible story. It goes on to, you know, become much better later, but it starts in these first two chapters with this really difficult, pro problematic text. Um, and I teach it on purpose because I want people to face the fact that we have some very difficult stories in our tradition that, you know, in our contemporary way, we hope uh, we're long past, right? But one, th so, so there's, there's, in other words, I can't, I can't polemicize and say, oh, no, no, you know, let's forget about that. Let's ignore that. The opposite. We have to face it. We have to face that like other peoples in the ancient world. And now we can say, if we haven't yet, other peoples in our world, there's terrible violence against another people. And that happens a lot in the Bible. But what I discovered and what I think is important is that's not the only story. The other story is that there is pushback against that. There is a way that other writers in the Bible firmly disagree. And not only because morally they think it's wrong, but because pragmatically they think it's wrong. There'll never be peace. In if you don't start thinking differently, that's why I started with the prophet Isaiah, who literally has a vision of peace in all the world. He has this beautiful, famous passage in chapter 11 of Isaiah, where he imagines the wolf and the lamb lying down together, a little infant playing on top of a snake's den that he could have been bit by the venom of a snake, but instead there's no fear anymore. This vision of, you know, the the time where we will be better uh, learning how to live with each other in the earth, in, the, in this planet. So that's probably not the answer people are hoping for, but I can say, and that one other thing I will say is that the Bible is also the Torah. When I say Bible, I'm thinking Hebrew Bible, the Torah, the Tanakh is very realistic. It's very realistic. It's not just, now I just gave you visions. There's a place for visions, but there's also a place for really hard-nosed realism. And the Bible isn't saying never make war, you can't make war. It recognizes there are times that there are needs, right? You all probably know, some of you know, the work of Michael Walzer, who really spent a lot of time on this question in the Bible, and he's much more of an expert on it than I am about just wars and unjust wars. Um, etc. So uh, uh, the reason I'm saying it's a realistic text is because I think it's part of its power. It hasn't, there are some things it couldn't anticipate. It did not anticipate social media and Facebook and Twitter, etc, etc, etc. No, but it did anticipate 
power and corruption and greed and also um, altruism and compassion and love, right? It imagined the human emotions, the psychology even that we some of us, that we know as well. Okay, off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I uh, I appreciate the uh, your reading there of the text and. Uh, your understanding in the world today, which so I want to leave. There's a few questions about how how some of these texts or relates to, to situations today. Um, sort of, I think about halfway through what you were saying. Um, maybe, maybe if you want to bring bring it to like you mentioned at the beginning, also um, Russia and Ukraine, and sort of well, there's a question as you know the Israelites invaded quote the promised land, and each each group feels they're justified in their own reason, um, and so I, I believe. Sorry, I lost the thought in my head, but I believe you started to address that in the middle of what you just spoke about. But um, how would you see things as being different and, or the same between those, those kind of situations? Right. So I really want to emphasize to all of you, I'm not a political scientist. I'm not a military expert. I'm a biblical scholar. I, my head is usually 3,000 years ago. So you can't expect all that much wisdom from me about these really difficult situations today. Um, I will say, you know, it's easy to talk about ancient Israel. It's really hard to talk about modern day Israel and the rights of the Palestinians, the rights of the Arab nations around Israel. There is some similarity in this very small country, you know, is surrounded by other peoples who will not go away. And I think Israel, thank God, has also convey that it won't go away. So ultimately in the state of Israel, there has to be some coexistence there, right? I mean, I think it's, if nothing else, it's pragmatically necessary. Um, how long can people spend billions on armies, lose people, etc.? The Russian Ukrainian, um, you know, I, I don't want to draw particular parallels between Israel because I think it's much more complex. I will say, uh, that the one thing that comes to my mind about the Russian unprovoked attack on the Ukraine, where thousands of civilians, including many children and mothers, my daughter just gave birth three weeks ago to a little baby that I could hold in a safe, clean, sanitized hospital full of love and hope. And I just shudder to think about the women who also were giving birth at that time on the border, somewhere else, shelled. I, I, I can't imagine, I mean, it haunts me. And I think what in, in that situation, in some ways you can say the Ukrainians were really underestimated by the Russians. And that's not dissimilar to the stories I was talking about with Joshua. Joshua had this big, you know, the book of Joshua had this big vision of conquering an entire land. And by the end of the book, it's not completely conquered. The book realizes it can't be done. There has to be alternatives. So there is some parallel there. I'm not saying, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate your, your reading there also. And um, there's a couple of just questions that are more, I would say, more, more broad-based. There's, there's a question here. Someone's asking about what, um, why does the Haggadah say my father was an Aramean? I think, you know, the wandering ah. Aramean piece. So, <laughs> you know, it's not directly related to what you've been talking about, but it is in the, in, in a sense too. Well, it's an Aramean and I was talking yeah. a lot about Arameans tonight. Exactly. Um, oh gosh, I even wrote a um, chapter in my book. Let me, let me just um, look at it because I haven't, I actually haven't looked at this in a while. It was a great, as you heard this, uh, was supposed to be a talk given two years ago. So yes, in ch um, part three of my book, in chapter seven, my title of that chapter is My Father Was a Fugitive Aramean, which is the precise translation of the wandering Aramean. The word for wandering looks like it means a fugitive, someone on the run. So what's the connection there? Um, I think the Arameans were actually if you dig into the genealogies in the Bible, which a lot of people don't like to do because they seem so boring, but they do give you a, a hint of, you know, the map genealogically of the ancient world. And there are a number of places 
where it seems pretty obvious that the Arameans are being treated by the Israelites as like first cousins. I mean, Rebecca, right? Rebecca um, comes, Lavan, who is, you know, her brother, um, who then has the service with Jacob and, and um, Rachel and Leah later on. But Lavan's sister is Rebecca, who is married to um, Isaac, right? Rebecca is um, an Aramean. And in, the, in Genesis, they talk about the Arameans as cousins. So when it says my father was a wandering Aramean, one possible explanation of it is they actually at some point spent time pre promised land in the area of um, where the Arameans were. There's a lot of interaction between the early, early Israelites and other peoples. They think, I mentioned Jethro, Jethro's considered a Midianite. There's some evidence that maybe Moses, uh, you know, whether or not there's a, or it's a real Moses, I don't have to go into that, but there is some thought that people might, Semites, who were um, connected to the Midianites ended up in the promised land and became the Israelites. We're talking about pre-Israel ending up there. Um, and there's evidence even in the Bible that um, in, in chapter five of the book of Judges, it's a very, very old poem. It talks about God coming from Seir, God coming from Sinai. Uh, and that's the area where the Midianites might have been. So there is even some evidence I'm saying this because it could be that the origins of the people of Israel are obscure. Could it be from the Midianite tribe? There was some connection to the Arameans as cousins, maybe not, you know, not directly. Abraham, we know, wandered through the Mesopotamian and the Egyptian area. So our tradition says those were the two great empires before Israel. Um, so there was a lot of interconnection. Yeah, thank you. It, it reminds me of, you know, even at a later period, um, sort of the Greek period, even there was just some like all the different, like who was a Jew and all the different, you know, whether or not you went through the Babylonian exile and such, there's just, there's so much there to the layers of who, who, who was an Israelite and in, in what time period. So um, I want to ask another, another question. Um, you can let me know if it's outside of your sphere, but there's a question here about um, the bathing in, in the Jordan River. Um, so, so seeming similar to Christian baptism, I, I could add to that mikvah. Um, and um, if there's anything you want to share about whether or not there's Christian interpretation there, anything further you want, want to share about, uh, about that? Um, again, I'm not an expert on early Christianity, but they got a lot of their customs and their um, their texts even from the Hebrew Bible, right? So um, Naaman would have been you know, Jesus is the year uh, zero, basically zero forward to CE, 70, 70 CE, etc. Uh, now, Amon would have been, as I said, probably around 800 BCE, 800 years earlier. So if the Christians, they would have borrowed the notion of the waters and their healing properties from these biblical stories. Uh, we know there was some kind of mikvah also because David sees Bathsheba bathing on her roof and people are assuming it could have been a mikvah that she was bathing herself from her period um, in Jerusalem and that would have been even earlier, the year 1000. So the idea that water is cleansing, purifying, uh, sacred, right, to, 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 to be a sacred act for somebody um, was all over. I think that was really, you know, certainly all over the Hebrew Bible and moving into Christianity in that way. Thank you. Um, is there is there anything in, in your or any lessons to be learned maybe um, from um, the this person notes that many of the uh, foes of Israel um, can be traced back to Esau. So I wasn't sure if, if there's anything in your in your uh, literary lens that, that that could shed insight on or you gain insight from. Right. I mean, it's usually Amalek that people talk about, right? Amalek is the tribe that did not give the Israelites water or food as they wandered through the wilderness. And so they're considered an enemy. And in the story of Esther, uh, Haman is considered a descendant of the Amalekites. Um, so they're usually the traditional enemy. I'm not aware of Esau um, holding that category. Asaph is considered, you know, uh, Sa'ir and Edom, which 
from time to time it would have been friends, not enemies. But you know, Asaph's a very um, sympathetic character in the Torah. He's not an enemy at all in the Torah. He's he um, is outfoxed by his brother ultimately, right? He his brother manages to get the blessing from him. Asaph and um, in in fact, Asaph weeps. Um, when his, when his father tells him that he can't give him the blessing, he says, isn't there anything more for me, father, right? So, you know, there, there is a, an attempt by the writer to make even that story between Jacob and Asaph more sympathetic. And then of course, you know, in Genesis 33, Jacob is prepared to face a furious Asaph with an army of 400 men. And instead, Asaph gives him a hug and a kiss and weeps over him and says, you know, my brother, I am so glad to see you. And Jacob says, seeing you is like seeing the face of God. So I don't think Asaph is accurately described as an enemy of Israel. There's later ambivalence about him. And in the Talmud, right, the rabbis start thinking of Rome as Asaph. How they got there is for a different lecturer, somebody who's an expert in rabbis, okay, in the rabbinic material. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, the, the maybe, yeah, maybe the person was thinking about that, you know, the, the more of the Talmudic example of, of Rome there, which is, you know, much, much later than the time period we're looking at today. So right. thank you. Um, there's a, another question here. If, um, it's not explicated in any detail, but does the binding of Isaac fall into to the, a similar category for you um, as your other stories? Uh, in what way? What do you mean? How does it fit into yeah. the category? I mean, the oh. only way it would fit into the category, it's a very important story, right? It's definitely one of those most important sacred stories we have in the Bible, the, um, you know, uh, Exodus 19, Genesis 22. I mean, there are plenty of others, but that's definitely one of them. Um, the only way that I see the story as fitting into this model that I'm describing is if you put it in the context of the chapter right before it, which I started saying before. So Genesis 21 is about Hagar and Ishmael. Uh, and remember, she ran out of water and she thinks her son is, you know, going to um, die of thirst. And she prays to God and God answers her and, you know, she weeps. It's a very powerful and beautiful story. And then right after that is the same story with a different parent and a different child, Abraham and um, Isaac instead of Ishmael. And so the idea here that lots of people have noticed is that um, Abraham needs to understand what he put Hagar through. He under, he needs to really get what it's like to feel one of your children will be lost in a, some kind of sacrifice or some kind of death. And it juxtaposes their stories to let us all know, right, that both of these people play an important role. Abraham is the father of the people of Israel. He's also considered, you know, the, the father of Christians and um, Muslims. Hagar is not considered, you know, a matriarch within Judaism. She is, I think, I know for sure she is in Islam. I don't know how the Christians necessarily, oh, that, well, they, that's too complicated how the Christians relate to her. Actually, I think they think she's like the Israelites because they turn us into slaves and, you know, the freedom comes from the New Testament, but that's really sketchy on my part. So let me just say that I think the story of the binding of Isaac and the story of the, um, the saving of Isaac and the saving of um, Ishmael really are meant to be read together. And as you know, you know, in conservative and orthodox synagogues, uh, I believe you read one on one day and the next one, I think you read Genesis 21 on the first day of Rosh Hashanah and the Akedah on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. Um, in the reform movement, they only have one day for Rosh Hashanah. So I don't think they read the Hagar story, but it is read on Rosh Hashanah in Jewish, you know, and more in the, the, in the conservative and Orthodox synagogues. And I think that's really interesting to continue to read those stories together. Great, great, thank you. Um, there's been a couple of people have, this is more of like a, a critique of your, maybe potentially a critique of your analysis. I just wonder if you, if you want to respond to it, but just trying to find your own lesson, like your, what, what you want to find out of the text or finding the lessons you're looking for in the text. Is that a critique that, um, that, that people sometimes say? I, there's a few people who have, who have said similar things. And, uh, and I just want to read what I want to see. 
Is that what they're saying? Yeah, or a critique of, of not necessarily of, of you specifically, but just of like the different lenses of biblical criticism. Um, well, I mean, as a reader, you want to have integrity, right? You don't want to make things up in the text if they're not in the text. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, honestly, I think we all bring our own lens to these materials. But I consider the way I read, you know, I'm very careful. I really work hard in the Hebrew to make sure I understand fully what the language is saying to me, how it operates. Um, I look for evidence all the time. I teach. I teach from my rabbinical. They can tell you how many times I say to them, great idea. Show me where it is in the text, right? Show me. It's not that it's not that I have to even agree, but if you can convince me that the text is saying that, then I will respect how you're reading it. And I didn't have necessarily, I mean, I, I really wanted to know what to do with the violence in these stories. And I was just surprised because I think what happens, people don't know the Bible very well. You know, it's like a grand thing. Oh, it says this. No, it doesn't. It says this and this and this, and it has a lot of subtlety and complexity and sophistication. And I'm not reading just for that. It's, a, you know, I think it really does. I think it was, how did it survive for 2,500 years, right? Because it is a very smart and wise and complicated text. No easy answers there. No easy characters. Even God, you know, can make us crazy sometimes. So yeah i don't know if that's a good answer but no, that, yeah i think that's i think that's i mean in my opinion that's a great answer and that's sort of what i was hoping something to the fact that i was hoping you would say because like that that you know it's an important message for people to hear often you you grow up with certain for you know one of the things you said you grow up with certain narratives of what the bible is and then they hear hear one of our scholars speak who says something different and like well that's why they're, you know, that's why you're here today. It's not, it's not to, you know, reinforce what maybe you were learned in, in Hebrew school or just some generic ideas about what the Bible is in our, our broader culture. So I, uh, I appreciate your answer. Um, just as, as, as we wrap up, I don't, I want to leave you with, you know, kind of if you want, if there's anything you want to pull back together, I know we've, 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 we've journeyed together. So if there's anything you want to pull back um, as some final thoughts together. Um, not really. I'm just, I'm happy that people had questions and responded and, you know, that meant they were listening, <laughs> which is great. Um, and um, you can always pass on further questions or comments to me if you want to. You have my email. That's fine. Um, so don't pass on my email. I get too many emails, but I'm happy to communicate via you uh, to the crowd. And, you know, at some other time, if it was live, I'd be happy to interact face to face with people. I really enjoy that kind of interaction, but at least we have Zoom, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, thank, yeah, thank you very much. This was a very a fascinating and, and engaging lecture. And um, I, I appreciate uh, the voice that you brought this evening. And, uh, and if anybody has further questions, we'll, we'll, we, can, we can pass them on to you as sort of like one in one bunch. Um, so anybody out there, if you wanna send uh, a question to our info account, please, please do so. And uh, thank you all again for joining us. And thank you again, Dr. Levine for this evening. And uh, we appreciate it. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.